Hi everyone, uh, it's Gerald with you again, uh, the Grand Seiko guy. I apologise for the hiatus. I was trying to get a little bit uh, swifter at putting up new, new uh, videos on on YouTube and new listings on the website. Um, today, what I want to do is uh, we're going to be listing the watch which is shown in the middle here, um, which is a an extremely interesting uh, example from the 62 Grand Seiko series. And the reason why I've got the other two watches either side of it is to set the context of, of uh, this watch. Um, the watch in the middle, this is the only example of this reference that I have ever seen. Um, there is a similar one like this with, um, with the stainless steel case. This is the, which I've seen a couple of examples of, but this is the, the sole example I've seen um, of the 6246 9001 uh, Grand Seiko with a 6246 9010 dial and what we'll let, let's just talk about the the 62 series in general um, this as many will know actually developed from the psychomatic chronometer uh, which i think was brought into the range in late 65 or 66 um, and then when seiko were uh, informed by the swiss that they could no longer use the term chronometer to describe their watches they they brought out the concept of the grand seiko standard and which was actually higher standard than the the swiss chronometry standards and the 6245 and 6246 seikomatic chronometers became the 6245 and 6246 grand seikos um, the first appearance of the grand seikos was in the 1967 volume 2 catalogue if i remember correctly um, and they were not in the range for very long. Um, they they date in terms of production. They date from sort of early to mid 1966 right through. And we also see some examples made in in 68, uh, which is where the final appearance in catalogues, 1968 Volume One, was the last appearance of the 62 series in the catalogues. Uh, the reason for that was because when we get into the second half of 1968, uh, we get the introduction of the 61 series Grand Seikos, which effectively um, took over from the from the 62s. Uh, the biggest difference, obviously, between the 61 and the 62, apart from the the cosmetic differences, is the 61 obviously introduced the 36,000 beat per hour movement. Um, so what we see on the left here is is an example of the uh, this is actually the 6245 because it only has the date complication, um, and this is how we see uh, pretty much every single example of a 62 series Grand Seiko. And a few things to, to point out, I'll just grab a spring bar, which is handy, is we note that the, the hour indices uh, follow uh, the Grand Seiko uh, grammar of design rules, uh, which were introduced with the 44 Grand Seiko, um, where we see this, it's just fl flat, very highly polished and faceted uh, indices. We, we can see from the light reflecting where the different facets are. And that's carried over into the handset as well, uh, where we see the hands... Uh, flat, uh, flat hands, just highly polished, uh, and then obviously with the with the angled edges as well. Uh, the case I'll talk about separately when I talk about the the specific watch which I'm going to be listing on the site. If we jump to the 61 series, we see that these particular two tenets of the of the grammar of design, which is the the facets, so it's a bit awkward doing it from that angle, the facets and the handset have changed, and we have uh, what I think is probably a, an onyx. A black onyx fill uh, in the middle of the facets and also in the middle of the hands and that is where this one comes in the 6246 9001 which is in the middle um, and this watch has the design of the hands and uh, the dial furniture if you like from the 61 series but obviously it's part of the 62 series why this watch exists i have absolutely no idea um, I have never seen a photograph uh, of this watch anywhere else apart from this example. Um, a pet theory that I have is maybe um, a few of these were produced for uh, either internal test um, sort of marketing or even external uh, customer marketing perceptions to see whether people valued the the, uh, the highly polished faceting or whether they would accept this this different way of of, of making the, you know, basically given legibility to the time. Obviously on the left-hand side, we're re relying very much on uh, how the light is reflected off the different surfaces of the hands and the indices. 
Whereas uh, once we get into the 62, 61 series on the right, and this is true for pretty much every single Grand Seiko that follows, um, where now we actually use contrast on the dial furniture and the handset itself uh, in order to, to make the dial legible and make the time easy to read. Um, as I say, I, I don't know any more about why this watch exists. Um, as I said, we do have uh, an example in stainless steel as well. Um, we decided to, to we're gonna list the, uh, the cap gold one first of all. Okay, so that's um, by way of introduction. What I'll do now, um, because I'm gonna uh, zoom in and, and just, just focus on the, the watch, which is gonna be listed for sale, which is obviously the one in the middle. Um, let's just run the, what I call the, the beauty video. Um, and so this is the studio shot where you'll be able to get a very good understanding as to the, the quality of this piece and, and really see it in much better detail than, than you'd ever see from, a, from an iPhone shot. So let's just run that. And here we go as it turns around. One thing to point out, um, and obviously I will also uh, in the listing provide a, a high resolution, uh, what we call the, the beauty shot. Um, obviously, this isn't this is not in mint condition. You notice little pits on the on the case. The case certainly, I'm I'm, I'm sure, has been polished in the past. And if you look at the dial, you'll see the dial is sort of spotted uh, at various points. You can uh, you can see that uh, quite clearly. So we will just come around to the to the other side. I'll point out the spots um, in a moment. But it, they're, they're nowhere near as as evident um, in in sort of the real in real life as as I say than uh, than we see on that video. Okay, so that's that's that video. Let's just uh, I'm just going to pause and then uh, zoom in. Okay, so I've taken the 61 uh, out of the way, um, and just before we f we focus on the on the watch listing, just maybe just this slightly uh, more zoomed in, we can see the the watches side by side. You see very 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 apparent uh, the differences between the hands and the, the hour indices. Uh, I, I have a, a very strong personal preference for um, you know these highly polished, uh, flat faceted uh, details uh, that we also see on obviously, which is very much a trend of the of the modern of the modern range. Um, but but, th but this is absolutely fascinating that that this this watch seems to exist as a uh, as a bridge, if you like, between the the pure grammar of design that we see for actually such a short period of time in the vintage Grand Seiko era. Uh, remember the 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 marketing uh, will tell you that the grammar of design was introduced with the 44 series, um, but in fact the uh, the 62 was introduced prior to the 44. So the 44 series Grand Seiko was introduced in the supplement to the 1967 uh, Volume 2 catalogue, whereas so that would have come out probably in the sort of up to the, the holiday season uh, in, at the end of the year. Whereas the 62 series uh, as a Grand Seiko was introduced in the 1967 Volume 2 catalogue and obviously existed as, as an identical watch apart from the branding in the in earlier as the Seikomatic chronometer. Um, so I have a strong preference for the, for the uh, if you like, you know, the pure grammar of design, uh, design aspects, uh, which are carried through to the, to the modern range. But in the vintage era, the true grammar of design period probably lasted less than a year. And then the design language uh, continued to evolve and move on. Okay, so that's a, a sort of a, a rabbiting about the grammar of design. Um, so let's just have a look, and I just want to talk about the, the quality of this, of this watch. Um, as I mentioned, um, as I was talking over the studio video, uh, we, we can see that this case has been polished. The, the, the facets of the lugs at the end of the lugs here uh, we can see is fairly fairly rounded and smooth. Um, do do have a look back at uh, an earlier video I posted of a uh, the unsealing of a mint uh, untouched case, and you'll see just how sharp these can be uh, when when they're untouched. But but apart from that polishing, I mean it, it is it is a very nice nice watch. We have we have some pitting here uh, on the on the side. I'll do the case back in a moment and talk about the case back. Um, I said the, the dial, I just want to see if I can highlight those spots on the dial. It's a beautiful um, sort of brushed uh, sunburst finished dial. Uh, you can see there how, how the light plays off. Uh, but I think, no, I, I think um, probably best to have a have a As I said, it's difficult to see in, in, in normal light. Um, but have a look at the studio video and also at the... Uh, the high resolution shot that I'll put up and you'll be able to see the, the, the spotting that's on the dial. 
slightly more clearly. Apart from the, the spotting the dial is in absolutely fantastic condition, these 62 series dials really do seem to barely age. Uh, you see many, many examples of uh, 62 Grand Seikos with, with absolutely immaculate dials, which is, which is fantastic. Um, a quick word on the, the day date. Uh, this, like the 6146 movement, um, only the date is quick set. So you can quick set the date, but you can't quick set the day. Uh, obviously the watch is uh, automatic, it's automatic only, so you have to uh, shake the watch to, to put some juice into it, get it running. Uh, apologies, I had to do a quick edit there for some background noise that intruded. Um, I was just explaining about the, uh, the fact that only the, the date is quick set. Um, the other thing to point out about this watch, uh, obviously this was the first automatic Grand Seiko, and uh, because it's automatic, we, we find that the, the crown, which obviously you'd normally interact with quite, quite a lot because of, of winding the watch, uh, probably daily. Uh, the crown is, is now very much uh, um, sort of hidden away almost. It's recessed, uh, recessed quite deeply and also placed at four o'clock too, uh, really because you know, you, you, you're not going to need to be needing to, uh, to use that crown. So that's a ni nice little feature of the design of this. Um, just on the design of the case, this um, is one of my favorite uh, Grand Seiko case designs. Um, it's bezel-less, so we, we have this fantastic sweep uh, if I just put the watch on the side there, so we have this fantastic continuous sweep uh, and surface from from lug to lug uh, around the side of the uh, the crystal uh, there, which is fantastic. Really superb design. Um, I say on this side again, um, we can we can see from the softness of the edges of the case and the roundness of uh, of these these edges here that this clearly has had some polishing in the past. Um, and we can see sort of slight pitting as well there. Okay, let's just flip it over. Um, and what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to bring back the, the other 62 that I showed earlier on. Uh, just a little bit of extra information just makes sense to drop into this video. Um, the first thing to notice, obviously this is a 6245, so this is just the day date. But if I just highlight that, you can see it's 6459,000, um, whereas the... 6246, uh, which is for sale here, is a 6469001, and that uh, difference in the case uh, was is purely down to the production year. 1966 production for the 62 series Grand Seikos uh, has a dash 9000 uh, as the case. Um, so we can see here this example was uh, one of the last ones, December 1966, and also has the um, Seiko Lion as the uh, medallion on the case back. 1967 and uh, into 1968 as well, early 1968, there are some examples. We get a, an, up, an update on the case number to 9001 and we move over to uh, the Seiko GS logo as the medallion on the back. I can see someone, uh, let's just move this out of the way and then I'll talk about the, uh, this case back. So 7501860, so 75, so this was manufactured uh, in May 1967, uh, we can see there's a there's quite a bit of wear on the medallion. As it, <laughs> this does seem uh, rather sad. It's quite quite common. You, you you can see where someone's probably tried to get this medallion off at some point, maybe to try to sell it for the for the uh, gold value, which is a bit of a shame. And uh, very heavily worn in terms of the uh, the raised the raised portions of the of the medallion. Um, I believe this to be a genuine one. I will check with the medallion expert. Um, I'm sure he'll let me know if it's not, but I'm, I'm fairly certain that's a, that's a genuine original medallion. Uh, there we can see a little bit clearly the uh, the uh, movement in case serial number, uh, sorry, movement in case number 6246-9001. Um, okay, so that's pretty much the overview. Let's let's just uh, finish off, let's just have a look, look at the lugs so we can see these are slightly curved, but in very, very nice condition. And we'll just spin it around and show the lugs on this side as well. Uh, so there we go. Okay, so there we have it. Um, this is going to be a very expensive watch. Um, it's uh, the 62 series are very, very collectible and uh, fetch pretty good values uh, just on their own. Um, this, because right now, I really do have no idea how just quite how rare this watch is. As I said, it's the only example of a 9010 dial on a cap gold 6246. Uh, that I've ever seen. Just to, just to sorry, quickly add the the this uh, later dial variant. Um, as I said, it's on the we we see it on stainless steel examples well, but only on the day date. Never seen uh, this this later 
uh, if we call it transitional dial into the 61 series. We've never seen this dial on just the date version. So only on the 6246. Um, I'm losing my voice, so uh, probably time to wrap this one up. Um, listing will be on the website uh, as usual. With a, there'll be a link in the description below. Um, I'm probably going to put this on price and application. Um, it is going to be expensive and not. So, I mean, clearly this is not the sort of piece that you would expect somebody who's just starting out to collect vintage Grand Seikos to purchase. This is, you know, something for the for someone who's building up a, a fairly substantial collection um, and wants, you know, sees an opportunity to pick up um, what, what is undoubtedly a, a very, very rare piece indeed. Um, and I think probably only time will tell uh, if, if, as we try to find out just how rare this piece is and maybe even at some point understand the, the reason for it existing. Uh, if anybody does see any other examples of this watch out there, uh, please do let us know. We'd love to know uh, of more example or be made aware of more example of this watch. Okay, thank you very much for watching and um, I'll be back early next week with another listing.